This is very Orwellian in its, uh, uh, in its, um, in, in its reporting and passionate, passionate writing about it. Um, uh, is, is, uh, is Orwell a part of your, your, um, uh, your academic background or uh, personal? It was long person? before my academic background. I remember when I was, um, what was I? I was 13, I was sent my, my grandparents have a, uh, live on, they're farmers, uh, or they were farmers, and they, my Swiss grandparents. I remember I was, uh, my dad had this, wanted me to learn German, so he, he dispatched me to his, his parents' farm in the middle of nowhere in Switzerland. And I'm not a farm boy. <laughs> I'm not a stick around boy at all. And uh, I remember my, my Swiss, he showed me recently, my dad showed me a letter from my, my Swiss granddad who died recently. <laughs> so a letter saying, wrote to my dad saying, ah, this boy of yours, he will come to nothing. All he does is sit and read books. He's like an imbecile. And anyway, the, um, the, uh, I remember one of the things I said, I just went to a bookshop and bought a great big pile of books because I knew I was going to be in agony. <laughs> this, this, this two months stuck in the Swiss countryside. And I bought uh, Down Now in, in Paris and London. I remember reading it, uh, God knows I must have read it 15 times at that uh, hellish farm. And um, yeah, it had a massive influence on me. The, 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 I just remember being incredibly excited when I read it. Uh, I remember thinking, I've never read anything like this before. Um, the, the, what he, what was incredible about Orwell, I, one of the things I always found incredible about Orwell is that some of his writing predates sound cinema, which always shocks me because I always think he writes in such a, a cinematic way, he writes in this incredibly camera-like way. Um, and I found that incredible. I, I remember being quite struck when that thinking, oh my god, he hadn't, he hadn't seen any talking films and yet he could do this. Um, so he had a, yeah, he had a massive influence on me, yeah. And not actually, funny enough, not the, the ones that everyone always cites. Obviously, I think 1984 and I'm masterpieces. But they, of all of them, I think they're the ones that least affected me because I never had any doubt that dictatorships were bad. And, and also because I was becoming politically aware after the fall of communism. I mean, by the time I was reading him, when I was 12, communism was gone. And being growing up as a left winger after the fall of communism, I always thought it was a bit like not that my family were left wing or I had any political identification, but realizing that I had those identifications, it always seemed to me bizarre. It was like being born into a family where someone had died before you were born who was obviously a psychopath who got around beating up granny and raping his daughters, and yet everyone loved him, and you you couldn't understand it. So. I think if I'd been born 10 years earlier, I think though 1994 and, and, and one would probably be affected me because I never had any, I, I never knew anyone who had very much sympathy with dictatorships or, you know, th they were actually the ones that affected me least. It was more the road to Wigan Pier, down that in Paris and London, or the essays that really had a huge effect on me. And is that journalism? Oh yeah. I, I would say that the homage to Catalonia is one of the best works journalism, but it's, it, it's engaged journalism. It's not, it's not the New York Times model of journalism, of, you know, dispassionate. But, I, you know, I agree with Nietzsche. It's when you think you're being dispassionate that you most reveal your biases. You know, I, I, think, you, I think there's a difference between trying to be truthful and trying to be balanced. And I've never liked the idea of balance. You know, I'm not someone I hugely admire but, uh, at all, but Bernard Levin had a great line where he said, um, uh, I, I'm a one-handed columnist. I don't do on the one hand on the other hand. And I agree with that. The, the balance... I too often in American journalism particularly, but to a degree in British journalism, balance ends up being balanced between lies and the truth. Where you say, you know, you report, you know, X says this, which happens to be true, not mentioned, Y says this, a bunch of lies. Well, that, that's not really balance. Sorry, that's balance, but it's not, that's not truth. So, um, I mean, I, I was never a straightforward reporter. I've always been a kind of opinion, uh, opinionated take on the news. Uh, but within that, you always have to, especially when you're in that situation, you have to really strive to be truthful. Uh, that's absolutely essential, but truthful isn't balanced. You know, like, like I see this when I go to Gaza, for example, and uh, what's happening in Gaza is, is unspeakable. The, the siege of Gaza is, is a really disgusting thing. You know, you've got the one and a half million people just locked, locked down, and and deprived of the basic things you need to live. It's, it's despicable. 
Um, now, you should, of course, listen to the arguments the Israeli government is giving. It is appalling that some people in Gaza fire rockets at Sibirat, which is a, a, a civilian city. You don't ever target civilians. Um, but it, it, the Israeli arguments are just disingenuous. The, 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 this is not the way. You know, this idea that the harder you beat the Palestinians, the softer they'll become is, is madness. They are, they are um, turning Gaza into a petri dish of Islamic fundamentalist theologies. Um, so when I go there, I don't feel tempted to write a kind of balanced, you know, here's this horrible suffering, here's their argument, here's the response of the Israeli government. Um, I, I wouldn't want to do that kind of journalism. It would, it would seem to me a bit squalid, really. I think that the... Uh, that doesn't mean you don't... And one of the other things, that really important lessons of Orwell, is that you... doesn't mean you don't... Not, even if you're sympathetic to a side, you acknowledge their flaws. And my God, there are hellish flaws in Gaza. Uh, if I was a... Gaza and I would be killed for being gay the, the, by Hamas. The, the, so you, 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 and this is one of the really important things about Amish to Catalonia, which is where I think Orwell is actually better than another one of my kind of uh, foreign reporter heroes, Martha Gellhorn, in that when he went, he, he obviously went there to fight against the Francoists, the, 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 the far right, but, but he wasn't blind to the horrors that were being committed around him by his own side either. And I think that that's very important, and that's another really important lesson from Orwell that you you there's always a temptation when you're politically committed to look over there at the other side and describe them brilliantly and kind of give your own side a pass, you know, and I think that's terribly dangerous and flawed.